Hello and welcome back to Subversive Radio. I'm your host, Keith Childs, and I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, I thought what I would do is kind of um, do a little bit of a background on Subversive, uh, what the name means, where, why I call my blog Subversive One, uh, and all that stuff, and a little bit of the history of kind of like how I got started blogging and writing, and uh, a little bit of why I do what I do. And that sort of a thing. Um, so if you've always wondered uh, or you are curious, <laughs> uh, here you go. If you're not, then you can skip it because we're not going to follow any sort of a topic or study or anything like that. I'm just going to kind of ramble on a little bit about uh, how all this got going. So um, I think with the story kind of begins um, – uh, it started off, I was writing, this is probably 2003, 2004. Uh, I had um, uh, started working for the company that I currently work for, um, but I was not working in the marketing and advertising side of the business. I was working in sort of the logistics side of the business, and um, I hated it. It was very technical. I'm a very creative person. It was all about tracking shipments and spreadsheets and pivot tables and carrier performance and all that stuff for uh, the Apple Computers uh, Logistics Division. And anyway, it was it was so painful for me. I needed a creative outlet. And so it started off, I was doing, I was actually writing science fiction stories and uh, short stories. And uh, then that kind of rolled into writing comic book scripts. I went online and I found artists who were exceptional artists who were willing to uh, basically work for free. I would send them scripts and pages. Um, they would create, uh, you know, the the panels. We we did a couple of short comics. Uh, a couple of them got published even in some anthologies. And um, yeah, so anyway, we did that. We had a website. If you if you look it up, it's called PlasticAnimalStudios.com. You can see some of the ideas we came up with there. And uh, anyway, I did that really just as a creative outlet, and it was it was a blast. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and, and one of these days, I've always said one day I may go back and I want to finish some of those uh, stories, either as as novels or as uh, maybe as comics. I don't know. But but anyway, a lot of those artists that I worked with, by the way, have gone on professionally to work in professional comic books and things things like that. At any rate, what it ended up changing all that for me was I met a, a guy named Scott Lawman. Uh, he's a great artist, artist uh, fine artist, uh, and he was he was going to the church that I was going to at the time. Uh, I let him borrow a book, and uh, we met for coffee. Uh, as he had finished reading it, he gave it back to me, and we had a, we had a, basically, I, I met him for lunch, and we had, we had lunch together, and just had a conversation. And just from that one lunch meeting from that one conversation uh it was such a catalytic moment for me for uh, it was a kingdom moment for me and i was so inspired by him and so inspired by what um for, for the things he was doing the vision he had for using his art for the kingdom um i drove back to work after that meeting and on my way before i got back to work. I, I had already made up my mind that I was going to shut down the whole comic book thing and I was going to start writing for the kingdom. And it was, it was I think, really the question that kind of began to, to mull around in my mind as a result of that conversation. It wasn't any kind of condemnation. I didn't feel like the Holy Spirit telling me that it was wrong for me to do comic books or science fiction stories or that kind of thing. Uh, because I was, by the way, trying to work into some of the those stories a little bit of a, uh, you know, kind of an under the radar kind of a gospel kingdom message throughout those stories. Um, but uh, no, but what I what I sensed instead was just sort of like the Holy Spirit whispering to me the the what if. It was like the Holy Spirit saying to me, "What if you used your time and your energy and your talent and your creativity to write for the kingdom?" rather than to write science fiction and comic books. And uh, so, yeah, I, I got back to work. I had made up my mind. Uh, within a couple of days, I had emailed all my artists. I told them I was shutting the whole thing down, that they were free to move on to do other things. And, and like I said, most of them did and got are still working right now professionally uh, in comics. And, and that's awesome. I'm proud of that. It's, they're great guys and great artists, and I'm glad that they 
uh, are now getting paid to do what they love. Um, but so what I – almost immediately what I started doing was I uh, I had already been reading Relevant Magazine. So Relevant Magazine ha- had just, I believe, launched their website. And, um, and so I'd been reading that anyway. I was going – you know, every day I was going and looking – reading articles on their website. And I was probably subscribing to the print magazine by this time as well. I think they had probably launched the print magazine by this time. And um, anyway, I thought, you know what, if I'm going to write for the kingdom, why don't I write for Relevant Magazine? Now, if nothing else, let me just try. So I shot them an email. I told them I was a writer. I sent them some samples of some of my published stuff because I, I had been a freelance writer already. I'd written uh, CD reviews for worshipmusic.com, and I uh, had been a writer, an interviewer for comicbookresources.com in the comic book industry. I'd interviewed Stan Lee and – you know, all the big names in comic books uh, at that time. And um, so I sent them some samples. I'd written, I'd written a few columns, kind of more entertainment columns about movies and comics and books and that kind of thing. Anyway, I sent them some samples of my stuff. I told them that, you know, I'm a writer. And I said, um, I pitched them the idea that I would interview different uh, Christian leaders. And I would ask them, I would have a column, a regular column, and I would call it subversive. And I would interview different Christian leaders about sort of what's wrong with the church in America. And of course... This was about 2004, and um, and uh, the, the emerging movement had just taken off. So um, there was a whole lot of, at that time, synergy around this idea of young people questioning their faith, questioning the church, uh, people like Spencer Burke launching the ooze.com and things like that. And um, so anyway, the, the miracle was they emailed me back and said, go for it. Sure. So that was amazing. So overnight, almost within within a few days, I had my own column at relevantmagazine.com, which was a, a small miracle. I I thought anyway that was amazing, um, and I was assigned an editor who was awesome. Uh, she was she was great to work with. Pretty much everything I wrote, uh, I sent it to her. And other than you know spelling uh, checks and things like that, what I wrote got published as is. And uh, so I interviewed, uh, and then this is where things got interesting. So I, I I interviewed – my first interview was a guy named Todd Hunter, which you may or may not know who he is. Uh, and if you live in Orange County, California, you have a better chance of knowing who Todd Hunter is. Todd Hunter uh, was one of the leaders in the vineyard movement at the time. And um, anyway, he, he is someone that I, I considered a mentor of mine at that point in my life. And anyway, I uh, I emailed him and said, hey, would you be willing to do an interview? So he was my first interview. We got on the phone together. We talked over the phone together. And uh, my first question to him was – and by the way, this was going to be my question to pretty much everybody I interviewed. I was planning to interview a whole bunch of different people for the column. Um, but my question to him was, what's wrong with the church in America today? And I was expecting an answer like, you know, we don't evangelize enough or we – don't care for the poor enough, or we're we're too focused on what we're against, or that, whatever. I, I you know I expected something like that, but the answer I got from Todd really shook me to the core. And honestly, the the ripples of that answer are still uh, affecting me today, ten years later, still affecting me today. Uh, and the answer to that question the, was, what, "What's wrong with the church today in America?" His answer was this. He said that the church in America today fundamentally misunderstands the gospel. And I and I didn't know what else to say after that. So I said, well, what do you mean by that? He says, well, you know, the gospel is not saying a prayer so you can go to heaven when you die. And I, and I, I was like, well, what is it? And he said, well, you know, if you go and read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, the gospels, and John, uh, what you see from the mouth of Jesus— is the gospel. Jesus says, I've come to preach the good news, that's what gospel means, the good news of the kingdom. And everything Jesus taught, the Sermon on the Mount and all the parables that he told, in fact, if you go and look back, go back and look. I I think every parable Jesus tells, uh, pretty much every one, there may be a a couple that don't, but most of parables that Jesus uh, told, they begin this way, to what shall I compare the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is like a man who you know, found a treasure buried in the field, or a man whose son, uh, you know, asked for his inheritance and ran away. We just on and on and on. The kingdom of God is uh, the beginning, the thought 
behind every parable. So every parable Jesus told was, uh, practically anyway, every parable Jesus told was about the kingdom. Uh, the good news that he came to preach was the kingdom. Uh, it even says that after the resurrection, Jesus continued to preach the good news of the kingdom. And then he sent the, the he sent them out to preach the good news of the kingdom. And if you, if you read the, the book of Acts, what you see is they're preaching the good news of the kingdom. And I'll be honest, I had never noticed that in my life uh, before. I was a licensed entertained minister of the gospel, had been so at that point in my life, probably for, gosh, 10 years or, or so or more. But I had never known that. My whole paradigm was that uh, the gospel was was about saying a prayer so you could go to heaven when you die. And so that shook me and really caused me to go back and rethink everything. And I and everything I've done ever since then has been uh, just the ripples that have flown out of that revelation in my mind and in my heart and in my spiritual life. And so <clears throat> the very first article, the very first interview – uh, that I did kind of blew my mind and uh, set things in motion. Um, and so I wrote for Relevant Magazine. I wrote articles, you know, original articles um, as well as interviews. And I did that for, I don't even remember how long I did that, maybe a year or so. A anyway, at some point, um, uh, at some point, uh, Relevant magazine, I changed my editor and I got a different editor. And the new editor kicked back an article that I wrote. I can't remember exactly which one it was, but I wrote an article that was a little bit, you know, um, a little critical of the traditional church. And uh, the editor, my new editor, kicked it back to me and said, can you soften this? Can you tone it down? It's a little too negative. It's, a, you know, let's make it a little more positive and da, da, da. And I just thought to myself, by this time, I've been writing for Relevant for, you know, like I said, a year at least or so. And I thought, you know what? I, I don't want to change this article. This isn't who I am, and, and this is not what I'm about. You know, the the column has set a tone uh, all this time, and I'm not ready to change it. So I said, you know, there. I said, never mind. So I submitted the article to, I think, the ooze.com, and then I started finding other online magazines at the time. And at the time, there were a lot. Uh, there was seedstories.com. There was the ooze.com. There was ginkworld.net, I believe. Um, there was one called nextwave.org or maybe .com. I can't remember. Uh, anyway, there was a handful of really cool Christian online magazines about that time. And and they were not picky. If I sent them an article, they would publish it, and I, they wouldn't ask me to tone it down or change it. So that's what I started doing. The other thing I started doing was, you know what, I'll just start my own blog. Uh, I'll just start my own little thing. So um, the first thing I did was I started something called Subversive Underground uh, Newsletter. And so that was a weekly newsletter. Uh, I think originally it wasn't a blog. It wasn't a website. It was literally my Hotmail account. And I picked like 10 or 15 friends of mine that I thought wouldn't mind being volunteered to be on an email once a week from me that would contain an article about uh, the kingdom uh, or something about the church or something about discipleship or following Jesus or that kind of thing. And, uh, that, and so I just started saying, you know, well, actually, my first one I sent out to them, I, I just told them, hey, by the way, I just added you to this email list. Uh, every week I'm going to be sending you an article uh, about these things. If you don't want to be on this list, just tell me. I'll take you off. I won't be offended. But but the the reason I did that, the whole point of it for, was for myself, was I knew I needed the discipline of writing something every week. And I knew that the only way I would – really feel compelled to sit down and write an article every single week was if there were, you know, a handful of people expecting it, saying, hey, Keith, where's your article? Uh, so um, that's the way I sort of I manufactured my own little stick and carrot, if you will, uh, for myself to get myself right in the habit of writing something every week. So that's what I did. Um, after a while, more and more people got added to that, that email list, manually added to the email list. Uh, until at some point I decided this is stupid. Why don't I just start a blog? Uh, I found blogspot.com. I started subversiveunderground.blogspot.com. Uh, and um, then people could just sign up an RSS feed. And then all I had to do was publish it. And I think it feed blitz. I used feed blitz in the beginning. And there you go. So uh, that's how that got started. So really what happened was I sort of had concurrently two, two blogs. There was the Subversive Underground e-newsletter, which was a weekly, uh, once a week, I would publish an article, and then that would, through FeedBlitz, email out to people on 
the distribution list. I think there was like 400 and something people on that list. And, um, and so anyway, that, that was going out once a week. That was my weekly newsletter, which by the way, I canceled. I did that for about three and a half, four years. And then I canceled that. Um, and then I had my regular blog is what I discovered is that I had other things. Eventually I decided, you know, there's other things I want to write about that, um, would be more often than once a week and, and, or are not the kind of things I necessarily think fit in a newsletter kind of a format or a weekly, you know, uh, article format, but are still just things I want to talk about or comment about. So that's why I started subversive one dot blogspot.com and that now is is my main blog or if you go to keithgiles.com it takes you there um and so that's where i've been blogging since 2005 um if you go back and look in the archives of that blog uh if you go back to 2005 and you go back to january of 2005 uh what you'll find is um really mostly the articles that i um originally wrote for Relevant Magazine that I republished on subversive1.blogspot.com. So that would be things like, I'm just going to scroll back down here, um, some of my first articles. So I did an interview with John Fisher, by the way, great guy. I did an interview with Matt Redman, uh, the worship leader, and I interviewed um, some guys in England called Throwstar, interviewed Jim Wallace from Sojourners, Dallas Willard. I did a three-part interview with Dallas Willard. And um, I wrote some articles about Christian art, reserving the punchline, and uh, some of my some of my best articles. Actually, it's getting a little depressing to think that some of the best articles I ever wrote are the ones I wrote when I started ten years ago. But um, articles like "Do You Feel Yourself Shrinking," um, uh, "Blue-eyed Jesus," which I think is pretty good. "Do Something" was another one I wrote. Uh, one of my favorite ones is. Probably one of my favorites of all time uh, is What If Jesus Could Be You for 24 Hours. That was one of the first ones I wrote the very first month of the very first year in 2005 uh, that I started um, writing my blog. So anyway, that's how I got going um, over the years. And gosh, I, I, I'm, I'm it's just been something. I guess I should explain what subversive means if you don't know what that is. I, I guess I should have started off like that. I apologize. Where are my manners? Um, what is subversive? So subversive was once I once I grasped this idea of the idea of the gospel of the kingdom. Um, what what I, what intrigued me was what I, what I began to understand was is that Jesus had this plan that the message of the gospel was was literally like a virus. Now Jesus uses parables to describe the kingdom and the gospel of the kingdom. Um, in ways like he calls it a mustard seed. And a mustard seed is a very small seed, but when you plant it, it spreads like wildfire. It's a weed. It'll take over the whole garden, right? It'll choke out everything else and become this massive tree that, you know, the birds of the air put their, uh, build their homes in or their, their nests in. Uh, or, or yeast. He uses the idea of yeast as the, as the a metaphor for the kingdom. And then it, again, the, it's something very tiny, very small that you introduce into this huge loaf and, and, uh, over time, it very quickly infects and spreads and covers and fills the entire loaf. The entire loaf now uh, has been infected with the yeast. And that is subversive. And, and if you think of it now in this sense, the gospel of the kingdom is a virus. It is a message. Uh, it's an idea that Jesus intends to start small in the minds and the hearts of, of his people, of his disciples, and slowly begin to spread and to change and overthrow the world system that we live in now and to change it from within. Uh, and that's what subversive is. The definition of subversive is a, it's a systematic overthrow of one system or power uh, by those working from within that system. And the kingdom of God is, is like that. It's a virus. It's an idea that's meant to upend, overthrow, transform, and change from within the current system, the current system being the way of the world, which is upside down from reality. Um, God's kingdom, which appears to us originally to be upside down, is actually right side up. The world is what's upside down, and uh, it's what needs to be turned upside down so that it will be right side up and aligned with uh, 
reality, which is the reality of Christ and the reality of the kingdom of God. So that's where the whole idea uh, of subversive came from. So um, in that process around 2005, uh, it's all it's when I started my blog, but it's also uh, when my wife and I felt called to uh, to leave the church we were a part of and start a um, a house church. And uh, and that whole idea was just something where we felt God calling us um, to take this huge step of faith and to um, to to plant a church where 100 percent of the offering would go to help the poor in the community. And it was a radical thing for us. Uh, we weren't sure exactly how that was going to work, uh, how we were going to pull that off. Uh, we had never heard of anything like a house church, and it took us a while to figure out that the only way we could have a, a, a church where 100% of the offering went to help the poor in the community uh, was if I took... Uh, you know, a job in the workforce, uh, the secular workforce, and um, and um, sorry, a- and um, we met in homes, and I didn't take a salary, and uh, that kind of thing. And so that's how we um, we stepped out in faith, and we did that, and um, that's how we started this crazy church. Uh, right about the same time, so we've been doing. Um, no, is that right? No, I'm sorry. I'm telling you wrong. I think because our house church has only been going about eight years. So that means we probably started, uh, I'm really bad at math, so that would be 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Yeah, so, so 2006. About a year, a year after starting the blog uh, is when we, yeah, when we felt God calling us to to step out in faith and do that so um yeah so anyway then uh, you guys i guess you know the the story from there i i blogged for years and years and years and um starting in 2005 i blogged and then eventually a lot of those blogs i decided i had enough writing that i could compile a lot of those blog posts into a collection so my i published my first self-published book called nobody follows jesus so why should you and that was really all about sort of the kingdom about the idea of following Jesus, about actually putting his words into practice, that the most radical thing you could do was actually to take the words of Jesus and just do exactly what he said. And um, and so that's that, that was my first book. Um, I published a second book uh, called The Gospel for Here or to Go. And my good friend Neil Cole was kind enough to write the foreword to that book. Uh, that was a series of, uh, well, it wasn't a series. It was a, it was a um, it was a workshop that I did for Soul Survivor Ministries, which I was working for at the time. And um, I did a workshop called The Gospel for Here to Go. And it's really just missional life. It was the whole idea of like how following Jesus and, and uh, our witness for Christ and our mission that we're, everyone is on uh, is something that we embody by just being who God made us to be. And rather than having some sales pitch um, version of the gospel that we could just – be followers of Jesus and invite other people to follow Jesus as well and to put his words into practice and, and that our mission would be accomplished by just being who God made us to be. Anyway, that, that, that's where that book came from. I, I had also started to write a book around that same time called The Top Ten Things Every Christian Should Know But Probably Doesn't. I didn't end up publishing that uh, for several years later. It just kind of lay dormant for a while and then I eventually published it. Didn't, pu- didn't widely spread it. But uh, it, and it's available. You can you can go to my Lulu. Well, if you go to my blog and go to my books page, you'll see it listed there. Um, um, so yeah, and then I also published my interviews from Relevant Magazine. I called that Subversive Interviews, where I published a book of the interviews I did with Dallas Willard and Todd Hunter and Matt Redman and John Fisher and Walter Kern, who's the author of um, um, what's the name of that book. It, my mind just pulled a blank. Anyway, he's a famous uh, author. He wrote a book called Thumbsucker that was made into a movie. Uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? There's another one he wrote. It became a movie with George Clooney. I can't think of the name of it. Anyway, uh, but anyway, interviewed Walter Kern. Uh, anyway, and the cool thing about that was uh, even though that's such a eclectic collection of people, I also interviewed authors like uh, G.K. Beale who wrote a book called The Temple and the Church's Mission, which is an excellent book. And that book really – 
uh, helped me a ton in writing my other book, which was This Is My Body, Ecclesia As God Intended. I interviewed him. That was a great interview. And anyway, I just collected all those interviews into a book called Servers of Interviews. Um, that, was, that, was, that was another book that I had published. Uh, there's also this slight chance that that book might be republished by another publisher very soon. I'm hoping that I'm going to hear from them about that. And uh, if so, uh, we're going to add a few other interviews to that to kind of uh, beef it up a little bit. And um, and because there's been some other interviews I've done since then, like Shane Claiborne and people like that, that I'd like to add to that. Um, so yeah, and then I just wrote uh, several ebooks a few years ago. I wrote uh, three ebooks: "War Is Not Christian." Uh, that's on Amazon.com for a buck ninety nine. Uh, How to Start a Ministry to the Poor in Your Community, that's 99 cents. And then I published an ebook version of The Power of Weakness, which I don't recommend. Uh, and here's why. Because I later, that, that, that received such a positive word of mouth from the ebook version that I decided to go ahead and make a print version, which is a, light years better. So if you're going to buy or read The Power of Weakness, uh, I recommend the print version. Um, and here's why. So Ross Rohde did a, an excellent forward to the book. Uh, I added like three more chapters. I expanded a lot of the content. It's it's a much, much better book. Uh, so I recommend The Power of Weakness, the print version. And um, and that's the most recent book I, I published. So my plan is um, – I got another two minutes left here. So my plan is going forward. I would like to publish uh, – at least, at least get started writing – uh, my book on the New Covenant uh, in the next year. Um, and I'd also like to write, write and publish a book about true Christian leadership in the New Testament. So anyway, there you go. That's uh, a little brief history of Subversive, uh, my blog, my former newsletter, and uh, this podcast. So anyway, thanks for listening, and um, I'm sure we will talk again soon. God bless. Good night. Let the kingdom come.